What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Sheehan Show here on Sherdog.com. And today we are looking ahead to Bellator 293, which goes down on the 31st of March uh, over in Temecula, California. And uh, it's um, it's the two highest weight classes in the, the women's division and the men's division that take the top of the stage here uh, as heavyweight prospects Marcelo Golm and Daniel James uh, fight in the main event and in the co-main event uh, the former UFC title challenger Katz and Gano um, faces off uh, against Ireland's own Liam McCourt uh, in a uh, possible number one contender bout uh, at the 145 pound division obviously which Cyborg sits atop right now spoke to Scott Coker uh, a while back and he was uh, obviously at the Ireland Garden and he was basically saying that the you know the winner of this is likely next in line we've seen chris cyborg kind of saying the same thing even though Sinead kavanagh who has a win over liam mccourt uh last year got a great win last time out so we i suppose we'll see you never know with mma matchmaking we'll see what happens with that but we're gonna break that down and some other fights uh, on the card as well former title challenger john salt was fighting aaron jeffrey uh, Rusim Kavalov, I suppose we all kind of do we remember him, do we not remember him from years ago, he's back here fighting Jaleel Willis uh, and there's uh, plenty of other stuff on the uh, on the card as well um, I'm going to start with some of the undercard stuff uh, and then we'll, we'll get to the, the top two or three fights because I, I think this is this is one of the cards where I think it's kind of even the whole way up there's some good fights all the way up there isn't any blow away fight on it though I think that apart from I suppose the, the, the women's featherweight number one contender fight when Katzingano fights it's always a big thing as well in my part of the world when Liam McCord fights it's always a big thing but there's I think there's a lot of the, the top prospects on this and a lot of actually good fights which may be going a little bit under the radar but because there is no blow away fight AJ McKee's on it Pitbull's not on it Bader's not on it uh, Nimkov is not on it Amasov is not on it you know so it's uh, and it's surprising for Bellator because like they don't have that many cards and that many events you think I don't know maybe something happened anyway um so on the undercard, I suppose a few of the people to, to look out for. The first card night, you when you ever see a Gracie, uh, it's it's always fun. Uh, Cranny Gracie is taking on uh, David uh, Pacheco in the opening uh, fight there. Uh, Maria Henderson, who we all know, uh, we, we saw Vincent Henderson fighting a couple of weeks ago. Um, obviously, she is his wife, and he is uh, he has said he didn't actually did the interview with me for for sure. Dog here last year, where he basically said that um, you know he's having the, the next few fights of his career and then he's moving aside so that Maria can take over and fight uh, and and live out her dream so that's kind of the start to this he, he had his retirement there a couple of weeks ago um, and now it's Maria's turn she's taking on uh, Mackenzie Stiller um, Maria's had one fight Stiller 0-0 so it'll be interesting to see how that goes then we have some of the prospects coming up I suppose uh, Randy Field who who is looks a good fighter she's 3-1 and one now she's taking on Ashley Cummings who has 13 fights Bryce Meredith taking on Brandon Carrillo in the early undercard as well and then we suppose I suppose we start moving to some of the higher quality fights uh, interesting fight uh, between Mike Hamill uh, and Nick Brown at lightweight um, Nick Brown, a former champion over in the local scene over in uh, the US uh, against Mike Hamill who's been around for a good while and I, I think the 9-5 and five record doesn't really show how good of a fighter he is you look at some of the names he's fought, he's lost to in, in that uh, Usman or Magomedov, Adam Barrocks, you know, Jordan Winsky is and, and a few more as well but He's he's taken some hard fights. He's taken really hard fights. He's just turned dirty at the end of last year. Um, he's on a two-fight win streak now as well, though. Two decisions over Bryce Logan, who had a great win over Peter Queeley, obviously in Ireland a couple of weeks ago, and he beat Killis Mata uh, as well. Now he's taken on uh, Nick Brown, who obviously came into Bellator with uh, a lot of hype behind him, with like only, what was it, 12-1, and I think he was. Uh, came in and beat Rat Garbage after winning uh, against Bobby Lee, but he uh, he met Islam Mehmedov uh, last time out. Um, I think when it was around October last year. I think it is. I just look at Charlie here. October of last year, he ended up losing that. Obviously, uh, we we all kind of know how that went with the wrestling, and you know he has a submission threat, but against Mehmedov, it's it's always going to be tough. So this is I I think a very very interesting fight. Um, 
I think, look, both of them can wrestle. I think Hamill probably has a little bit of advantage there. Brown a little bit of an advantage. Uh, standing, I, I think Hamill is very dangerous always. He's very he's good cardio, but I think he's very dangerous in the early goings in terms of he'll take you down uh, with more of a fervor. I think if he can kind of get through that, maybe not get taken down over and over and over again, uh, I think that fight kind of turns far Brown at that stage. But um, if Hamill can keep it going and keep getting takedowns, you know, it, the fight is there for him, but um, I, I, you know what, I'd probably just about favor Mike Brown or Mike uh, Hamill, Mike Brown, uh, Mike Hamill in that one, but uh, I think it's a 50 50 one. Uh, in the next fight, didn't have yet. I'm, do you know what, I'm a big fan of Rakeem Cleveland. Um, I've watched a couple of his fights before for uh, preparing for fights to see Maury fight the Terrell Farty fight. And unfortunately, he lost both of those in round one. But he's a good fighter. He's a uh, a fun fighter, a good athletic heavyweight who uh, you know who throws his shots. And he's a guy. You know, there's there's a few fighters you watch here, and you're like, ah, Jesus. It's a bit of a toll to be going back and watching some of their fights, but not him. He's very, very good, and I enjoy watching his fights. He's fighting Christian Edwards, who's only 5-2. and two. Uh, He's coming out of uh, Jackson Winkle, John. He lost his last couple to Ben Parrish and Grant Neal, but there was a lot of hype about him before that. He'd beaten Simon Biong, who's a good prospect as well, uh, in his, uh, his sort of fourth belter fight. Actually, he's all his fights have been Bellator, so a bit, of a, a bit of a setback for him in the last two, and he'll be looking to bounce back here, but it's not an easy bounce-back fight at all uh, against Rack. Uh, Cleveland so I'd be interested to see how, how that one goes you know um, Edwards hasn't the, you know the, the biggest amount of finishes in the world for a, a heavyweight he's two decisions two knockouts and one submission um, and like he to, to me they, they're both Joe they're, they're both very fast starters both guys who will absolutely throw it all, and both guys who can cause other people problems with just the way they move. Like at heavyweight, we're used to, and we see this in the main event as well, uh, in terms of the opposite of this, but we're used to kind of big, lumbering guys who are kind of, you know, especially maybe at the lower levels or the on the way up, uh, who are not, you know, not the most athletic creatures in the world you know we're not exactly used to seeing the Junior de Santos or the John Jones or the you know the, the Overeems or the Cipes around that level but what Raheem Cleveland is is that what Christian Edwards is is that as well uh, and when the two of them meet they probably haven't met many lads now obviously I think Edwards has done a bit of training with John Jones so you get what I mean they haven't met many lads in the cage that are going to be of a similar ilk to them in that respect. So, very interested to see how that works out. Um, at this, look, I, I, I probably, I probably am leaning towards Edwards. But having said that, I do like Cleveland, and I feel like Cleveland is is going to be. Bellator are going to keep giving him chances until he beats one of them. <laughs> and then they're like, ah, no, go ahead. No, they won't, they won't. But uh, I do think he will, like, if they keep putting him in there against all these prospects, uh, our, our lads on the way up, I do think he'll beat one because I like him and I think he's a, he's a good fighter. So, interested to see that. Um, women's featherweight, then, interesting. Like, there's been a lot of movement in the women's featherweight division over the last while. Pam Sarn has taken on uh, Sarah Collins uh, coming out of... Um, uh, coming out of Australia. Now, she's only had uh, three fights. This is her uh, debut in Bellator. Two decisions, one arm power. Uh, look, it's it's a difficult fight to be gone into for your fourth fight. Uh, you know, she fights out of the, the, the gym with a lot of the good fighters in Australia. You know, the likes of, um, you know, Daniel Kelly and, and many others as well who've been around for a, a long time. Ben Palmer. and You know... <sighs> Pam Sorensen, I actually watched uh, I watched one of her fights there for uh, the uh, the Zingano fight coming in, and you look at Pam Sorensen and you kind of see someone who will beat most people up until a level. And if you look at her, like her losses, Zingano, Blinko, Spencer, uh, Indiana Gomez a, a, a few years ago, Shani Young a few years ago again. She's beaten everyone. It's best Jessica Rose Clark, uh, Elena Kolesnik, who we saw over in PFL, Jan Finney, Clayton and Young. She's beaten some good people, but when she gets kind of to that mid-level range, she loses to them. Now, where is Collins? We don't know. We don't know. She's very much an unknown. Uh, you'd expect Sorensen to win this, but this division badly needs new, uh, you, you know, new blood. And if Collins can be that, it's massive. It's absolutely massive for that division. So, uh, let's see, uh, let's see how that goes. Um, we have the, I suppose, a quartet 
of big prospects then for Bellator, Lance Gibson Jr., Lucas Brennan, uh, Joey Davis, and Archie Colgan, uh, who's taken on another prospect in uh, in uh, Justin Montalvo. First of all, I suppose on, on that fight, Archie Colgan six and zero oh now, uh, training out of uh, out of Genesis. Uh, he got a, a you know three wins last year, uh, coming over from uh, he had one fight over an Eagle, I think actually, but he's other two in, in Bellator. And he had a fight before that uh, in Bellator uh, as well. Well, and he's getting finishes now as well. He's getting knockouts. Uh, Justin uh, Montalvo uh, fighting out of Sarah Longo. And, you know, this is his third uh, outing of Bellator uh, as well. He's looking for the, the fifth knockout in his career after, you know, a great start that both carry, uh, carry power. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that one goes. The other prospects, like, it's hard to pick between them in terms of how good they are. I really like uh, Lance Gibson. We'll get to that fight in a second. Joey Davis, he's taking on uh, Jefferson Creighton. Uh, eight no now, five knockouts, three decisions. Um, hasn't fought, though, since 2020, you know, and let's, I, I suppose he beat Bobby Lee in that after winning all of his previous uh, Bellator, uh, Bellator fights, coming back here against Jefferson Creighton. Um... Lucas Brennan is seven and uh, in his career now, um, fighting out of uh, next generation Frisco, five submissions. You know, very obviously very good in the ground, and only twenty two years of age, so no need to uh, to rush him. But one guy I think that kind of maybe is getting rushed a little bit is uh, is Lance Gibson Jr. Just because of how good he is, I think. Um, I, I've been very impressed with him. He's seven and zero, and he's fighting Vladimir Tokov now. Who's okay? Vladimir Tokov's only seven and two, but you know his brother. Obviously, we know how good he is. We know he's fighting now, fighting out a Fedor team, and uh, you know he has been fighting since two thousand and sixteen as well. Only maybe having you know one or two fights a year. Obviously, he was out, was out between twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty two. He's a win. I, I was actually at the fight against Daniele Scatizzi, who's a very good fighter, won the decision there. Ended up losing to JJ Wilson after that. Lost the fight before that as well. But JJ Wilson is one of the top fighters uh, in the division in, in Bellator. So it will be interesting to see that. I feel like I'm saying every night is interesting, but I really do like this one. You know, you see, out of all the defeat, Team Fedor team, and you know, um, Anatoly Tokov as well is, uh, is similar to obviously his brother Vlad, um, uh, Vladimir. A very well-rounded fighter can do it all, uh, and for for Lance Gibson Jr., it's the first real test of his career against someone like that. You know, a lot of the lads like you know Dominic Clark, uh, doing uh, Raymond Pena. Well, you know, we don't know these names offhand, um, and he's been you know putting them away and finishing them. Uh, you know, three knockouts and two submissions in in his seven fights, um, and I think it is. It's interesting because like Bellator, uh, interesting. Uh, Bellator haven't been stepping up these lads massively, um, early, and I wondered like, is there a couple of people who maybe could be? You know, he's twenty eight years of age now as well, so you know, not he's not not a child. He's not young. Uh, let's say, um. And I think he's ready for it. You know, I think he's ready for that step up. And I think it's a good matchmaking. You know, a step up to a guy who has a similar amount of fights. Obviously, the same amount of wins and all that. So not a massive, massive step up. But one that'll make sense. One that'll get him to a place, you know, maybe to the rankings or to, to you know, further up the rankings or whatever it might be. I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, his wrestling is very good. Uh, his striking is very good. But if he can get his wrestling to work against Tokov, I think it'll work against a lot of the guys that that's, you know, that part of the uh, of the division. If he goes, uh, Sam can go for the rest of his game, to be honest, because you have to be a well-rounded game, and he, uh, you have to have a well-rounded game, and he definitely has that, so I'm looking forward to seeing it. Uh, I, I'm picking Lance Gibson to win it, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, one fight I think will be, uh, you know, fun if... Uh, if it goes the way of one of the lads, will be uh, Rat Garbage, Mandel Nalo against uh, Adam uh, Piccolotti. Uh, you know, Piccolotti uh, came into the last fight with, uh, I suppose, a lot of hype um, over in Italy. And he was, you know, he, he was in the main event and all. And he met Mansoor Banui, who uh, I know a lot of people probably didn't know, but they probably know now as one of the top prospects in the world. And he ended up losing that. But before that, he had beaten Georgie Carcanyon. And, you know, he'd been in there with Ben Henderson with the split decision, split decision with, with Sidney Ola, you know, two of the top guys uh, in the world. Um, 
you know, he's obviously we we know Piccolotti. He is good on the ground, good submissions, uh, and all of that. Um, and that's what he needs to do against Nalo. I think I think he needs to take him down. He needs to pull him to the ground and and hold him down as much as he can. Um, and I'm not sure if it'll be enough. Like you look up, uh, you look up Mandel Nalo on. YouTube and what you see is YouTube shorts, you know? You see he's knockout of Bryce Logan, you see he's knockout of Ricardo Sexas, uh he's knockout of uh was it Carrington Banks as well, Alex Williams as well as one uh, that came up there. That's what you see out of him. He is a power puncher, you know, he's a funny guy, a fun guy and all of that. Um and he'll be looking to do that against uh, against Piccolotti. You know, does that always happen? Uh, no, but Will it happen here? Um, I, I, I'd go for him. I'd go. I'd go for Nala to win this one. But it's, uh, it's a fight. I think pick a lot here. They both look. They both have ways to win it. Um, but uh, you know, Nala will need to uh, land that big shot. I think. Um, we talk about prospects as well. I love the prospect versus prospect match of Sullivan Colley versus Luke Trainer. You know, uh, Luke Trainer coming out of the UK six and one. He lost the fight to Simon Biang. Um, back in the summer of last year, but then he came back with a very good win uh, over in that same card I just mentioned in Italy. Before that, he'd beaten Yannick Bahati, uh prior to that, who was a very, very, very good fighter uh, and has been around for a long time. You know, he, he can he, he trainer is big and tall and long. He's not maybe not the fastest guy in the world or anything like that, but I love the way he kind of he throws his jabs and he uses his lint. He's very, very good at it. Uh, but he's coming up against a tough matchup here against the, you know the wrestler Sullivan Colley, who was a wrestler, but he now is knocking lads out. Um his first fight against Jason Marklin, he landed a big right hand down the middle, ground and pounded him out. Um, and he's been knocking everyone out since, you know, ground and pound, but landing shots on the feet as well, all first round finishes, and it's a very, very, very tough fight for both guys. It's a massive step up, I think, for for it's a, it's more of a step up for Kali, uh, to be fair, because Trainer has had you know the, the couple of tough fights, but Hattie is would wipe the floor with everyone. The the that Kali has fought, no MMA match, you know, we're not adding that up here, but. I actually do think Collie will win the fight, but I wouldn't be at all sure because this is a very interesting one. Uh, I don't think a trainer will roll over the way some of his other opponents have, have been forced to roll over, in fairness. But, um, and having said that, you know, the way as Collie fights, it could be early, but it won't be as easy, I think, let's put it that way. And if he does be a trainer in that sort of fashion, we can start talking, um, you know, massive moves up in the light heavyweight division for him. Um, in the welterweight division, then, Jaleel Willis takes on Rustam Kavilov. And I think this is a very interesting uh, styles matchup. But before we maybe get into that, let's talk a second about Kabilov, who's been out for a long time. You know, we all know him in the UFC. He's 30, 36 now, hasn't fought since 2019. Um, you know, and, and even before that, he wasn't the, the most active in those couple of years before that. Now, he fought, was it four times in 2016, but once in 2017, once in 2018, and okay, twice in 2019, but still and hasn't fought since so you know in the last what six years he's only fought four times uh which which isn't great but when he did fight you know he was a good fighter he power in his hands but great wrestling the ability to get inside he kind of uh, like his, his opponent in, at the weekend uh, herky jerky was the word i'd use for both of them but Habilov was weird he kind of like the way he moved was like herky jerky on the inside whereas willis does that on the outside but he was brilliant kind of dropping his head, moving out the way of a shot and coming back in and either getting the clinch or getting the takedown. He was really good at that. And once he got you to the ground, he was excellent. But he was also good at getting, great at getting the um, the body lock. And we all know about the Javi Love suplexes that are almost in lower now at this stage. But Jaleel Willis, he's a good fighter. You know, I see that herky-jerky again is, is all I use on the outside. Switching senses, moving around. He's kind of in, out, in, out, in. But not all the way in and all the way out. He's kind of just moving in a weird fashion all the time. And I actually think... I, I think he's kind of afraid of getting a little bit tired. And we, we'll talk about Daniel James in the main event as well in a second. I think he's a little bit uh, similar in, in that fashion. And Gorm as well to an extent. But um, I think against Crutchmere, he showed that he can beat a wrestler, you know, and he can land that left of the body and he can land that shot uh, as he's on the way in and he can make him pay. But Berkamov was the opposite then. You know, he took him, or he, you know, he knocked him down and got on top. 
And in the fight before that as well, the Mendoza fight nearly it nearly went against him. He loves going to the ground. He loves going for takedowns. He loves getting on top. But then he gets, you know, I don't think he maybe he's the best jiu-jitsu in the world. He kind of gets rolled over. He gets turned away. He, get, he gets swept. And I think if if he does that, if he if he tries to initiate the grappling here or gets taken down, he's he has massive issues against Rustam Kavanov. If he knocks him down, let him stand back up and punch him. Like, do not go to the ground with him. Do not go for takedowns against him. Just don't, because those transitions on the ground are a big issue for him. Uh, and I think, yeah, I think it is going to be a big issue for him if he does that. So, uh, and I, you know, I just think it's in him kind of. So I think he will, and I think uh, Habilov will win that fight. So the top three then, look, this Salter Jeffrey fight at middleweight, they all matter, I suppose, at middleweight because uh, it's tough to know what the crack is at middleweight now because we, and I, I, I'm just trying to quickly pull up the rankings here because, like, Fabian Edwards seemed like he was the next guy in line. And then, you know, Fabian is fighting here coming up soon, isn't he, against Gegard Mousasi, which is weird because Fabian's number two, Mousasi's number one. Mousasi obviously just lost to Eblen. Would you think the guy just behind Musasi would be the guy fighting Eblen next? But no. But we have Salter at number uh, three and Jeffrey at number seven. So you think if Edwards loses that, the winner of this could very well be the next guy uh, in line to uh, to fight for the title. But you never know, you know, Lorenz Arkin had a great win there as well recently. There's a, a few other lads on the way up as well. So we'll, we'll see on that one. But having said that, you know, this is... I, w- I wouldn't go necessarily just a, 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 a striker versus a grappler, but it kind of is, you know, John Salter, a good, uh, well-rounded fighter, but, you know, if he's going to win fights at the higher level, I think it's probably going to be wrestling, whereas Jeffrey, 13 wins, 9 knockouts. We all remember the big knockout of, uh, over uh, Austin Vanderford, knocked out Fabio Aguiar before that as well. Look, but if you look, you know, he's lost there recently, lost to Kao Bahalio, who is a very well-rounded fighter. Um... But it does have some very good wins. Colin Hookbody, who's you know fought some good guys, he he's been in there with some with some good lads. He's fought against Sean Brady, fought against Brendan Allen, lost the ball of him, but still, he's been in there with him anyway. And you know, for Salter, it's it's probably now or never at thirty eight years of age, having lost to Eblen, have to having lost to Musasi. Uh, you know, and I haven't said that even if he wins here, he's probably not next in line. If we're if we're looking at that, if we're being honest here, but. You know, Costello Vancinas is there as well, who has who he has a win over, so you'd never know what's what's actually gonna happen there. Um yeah, it's it's a fight that I think I'm picking Aaron Jeffrey and I think he's the coming guy. Uh and if he can land that big shot, if he can keep the fight on off the floor or off if he can keep off his back anyway, I think he might have the advantage here. So we'll see on that one. Uh then the top two fights. Um you know, I they're probably a little bit maligned, if we're being honest, in terms of people look at this card and go, oh, Jesus, these are not great, but uh, in, in terms of headliners or co-headliners, I, I do think you look at the fights, though, and the two fights, it's good matchmaking, and they're two interesting fights, uh, interesting, for by themselves. Katz and Gano against Liam McCourt, look, I, I'll, I'll train my bias here as an Irish MMA fan, it's a very exciting fight for an Irish MMA fan, because... You have Liam McCourt, who's been around for a long time, who we all know and, and admire the way she fights and the way she goes about things. I've had her on for interviews here, and I think everyone uh, enjoyed uh, her as a person and, and the, the way she speaks and carries herself and all of that. Uh, for her to kind of reach the stage of her career and have an opportunity against Katzengana, which might lead to an opportunity against Chris Cyborg for the title, is massive. So looking at it from that point of view, this is a massive fight for Liam McCourt. It's also a massive fight for Katzengana. You know, she loses this, it might be... Might be the end for her. She wins this. She's a big fight uh, against Chris Cyborg, who, you know, hasn't really been concentrating MMA for the last while. It's like we've seen recently. Shevchenko's been beaten. We see Nunes has been beaten. They've all been beaten. Like, oh, Cyborg's time has to come at some stage. Could it be McCord? Could it be Zangana? Could it be Sinead Gavina? You know, a lot of people probably say probably not, like, but... Someone will do it soon. Someone will do it. Who's it going to be? And will, like, will they even do it? Will they even get the opportunity? Is Chris Iber coming back to Belter? Who knows? But this is a fight anyway. Whatever happens, this is the fight for number one contendership. If it's Cyborg, if it's maybe Sinead Kavanaugh for the vacant title or something like that, if Cyborg doesn't come back, this is a massive fight because it puts you right there. It puts you right there. Um, look, I'm supposed to look at both of them then. Cat 
very interesting. I watched back both her Bellator fights, um, and you know, Cat has suffered massively with injuries over the last few years. And uh, well, t- sorry, two of her three Bellator, uh, actually all three of her Bellator fights. The other one was a quick armbar. So the the, the two fights I'm talking about, uh, she was very grapple heavy. And you know the the time out of the the cage as well. Just before I get to the grapple heavy part, fought in twenty twenty two once, fought in twenty twenty one once, fought twenty twenty once, didn't fight in two thousand nineteen, fought three times in two thousand and eighteen, didn't fight in two thousand and seventeen, once in two thousand sixteen, once in two thousand fifteen, once in two thousand fourteen, once in two thousand thirteen, once in two thousand twelve, once in two thousand eleven. We're going back now twelve years, and you know she's had one year with multiple fights. That is that's not great. That's really, really, really not great. And as I said, this is the opportunity at forty years of age. It could be the final opportunity, and it's a massive fight for her. But where I'm going as well with that, with the wrestle heavy part of it, she's won three fights, and especially the Sorensen fight, I think, came straight out and went for the takedown. Straight out and went for the takedown. She ended up landing the illegal knee, straight in for the takedown again. Next round, straight in for the takedown. And I, w- I wonder, is that a function of maybe the injuries? I wonder, is it a function of trying to stay safe, maybe trying to stay injury free? Uh, and how long will that last? Like, will that last until you get to a title shot? Like I, I don't know. I don't. I actually don't know what the reasoning for it is. Now, like she's always been good underground. She's always been, you know. I suppose um, maybe ground heavy, but never as much as that. I don't think. And the point I'm making here is that's an interesting thing because you're fighting Liam McCourt. Usually, Liam McCourt, it's the opposite when you want to fight her. The game plan is keep away from the ground because Leah is very, very strong. She's good jiu-jitsu, very good uh, judo as well. If you push the fight against the cage, she's strong there, strong hips. She puts you on the ground. Um, you know, it's usually on the feet that Leah has, the, the thought has been that she's susceptible there because of her background. And, you know, she's been learning that. She's been over at Molly McCann. I think she showed glimpses of it the last two fights. Obviously, against Sinead in the fight she lost, but in her last fight as well, she looked way better on the feet, even though, like... You know, it was one of those fights. It was a very much a must win for Leah at the time. I think she had a lot of pressure coming in. Uh, even I was talking to her. She's like, she told me after it's the only interview I'm doing. I'm not, you know, I'm not talking to people and stuff. And afterwards, we interviewed her, and it was almost as if it was like I need to just go home and get this over with. It was it was one of the months where she usually enjoys it. I think, and she usually, especially afterwards, she's all she's joyous after. It. But it was a it was a big moment in her career that one, and. That's almost that kind of setback of a loss. Then that uh, almost uh, you know a tough week. I think turns it upwards after that. If you get me, so it's a down, little bit back up, and now you're up for a massive fight like this. So Liam McCourt is intern uh, intern this at a very good place. I think at a very 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 good place, and um, I just wonder how it'll go. I really I really do wonder how this will go. Like I spoke about Cat being very wrestle heavy in the few fights that she ha- the few part of the fight where she had struck she hasn't looked bad at all you know her high kicks look good she really likes to fight from the outside and kind of dive in with her wrestling uh, and I think that'll probably be the game plan in terms of the kicking from the outside against Leah kicking to the body kicking high um, and you would think that will it'll be more strike heavy from Cat in this fight you would think that logically but as I said that hasn't been the way she's been fighting recently is she fighting for the opponent is she fighting for herself uh, in terms of the game planning, I don't know. If it is for herself, it's very much not the way she should fight against Liam McCourt. But if it's for the opponent, maybe she won't fight that way this time. Uh, if you're looking at it from, so from her point of view, I think if she does get the fight to the ground, stay on top, stay heavy, don't give Liam much of an opportunity. We've seen what she did to Janae Harding. We see the upkick, we see the triangle. Very good in that position. So Cat will have to be careful there. But on the feet... If she stays on the outside and lands those big shots and doesn't get Leah time to kind of maybe land that jab and use her lint, I think that's where Kat can get, can get success. Leah, on the other hand, then, I think she needs to do what I was saying Kat shouldn't do, close that distance, push her against the cage, get into that fight inside. Like, sure, that you're the strong one, that you've better judo. That you, you know, we all saw the last time she fought a judo, can run around, see what happened. She was thrown down and submitted in seconds, you know, and maybe she fought a couple since, but you know what I mean. That's the fight I've been thinking of. Not necessarily it's going to be over in 14 seconds or whatever, but get inside against her. If she throws that big high kick or whatever, catch her and put her down on the ground, 
and get on top for use your size and weight. Like Leah is a genuine 145 pounder as well, whereas Cat isn't. You know, Cat's a 135 pounder uh, at least, you know, uh, at maximum. So use use that size use your judo use your jiu-jitsu inside and there's 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 a, a path to victory there for Leah McCord look I think Cass is going to be favoured the odds aren't out yet but she's going to be favoured and she's probably going to be a big enough favourite but um, I think it's one I'm massively looking forward to and you know for uh, women's MMA in Ireland it's been a massive time Danny McCormick won the, the title there and Invicta a couple of weeks ago Sinead Cavan had a massive win if Leah wins here as well and Sean Bannon won as well and Invicta a couple of times ago Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So I'm looking forward to this, and uh, you know, may the best woman win. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, the main event then, um, Golm against James. Uh, it could really well be to decide who next fights for the title. It could be because we know Lyndon Vassell beat Moldovsky. The plan was, I asked Cock Oker about it. He said, oh, well, we'll wait for Moldovsky. And Moldovsky lost. Vassell's already fought for the title. Could it be Golm? Could it be James? Uh, let me just have a look at the, 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 the trusty Bellator rankings again and see where they are uh, in this division. Uh, Golm is at five. James is at seven. So there you go. Like, uh, <sighs> Could be, could be one of these. You'd never know. Um, the fight itself. I looked at Gollum, and he, you know, he's one of these guys that is athletic at heavyweight. I spoke about someone else earlier. You're almost not expecting it. You know, you're you're not. You're almost not expecting someone to be this athletic at this level of heavyweight. But he is. He throws nice leg kicks. He's lovely feints, lovely combos. Varied as well with his work, which I like. He goes to the body, goes up high, uh, goes down, as I said, to the legs as well. Um, and he has good cardio. You know, he's been taken down, susceptible to a takedown at times. But when he gets back up after, he does look good and he does have good cardio. So I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't criticize him for that at all. You know, he looks, he looks like a light heavyweight in there. Daniel James on the other side then, he's fast. You know, he's very fast for the size of him. He's big. He, and do you know what he loves to do? He likes to punch and clinch. That's what he loves to do. That, that is almost his whole game. He'll go inside, he'll clinch you, and just kind of hold you there for a while. Maybe throw you to the ground and land on top. Maybe. But he'll just hold you and hold you and hold you and hold you. And then he'll either, like, let you go and land a big shot in the break, an uppercut usually, or he'll, like, fall on top of you and land some big ground and bound and put you out that way. Um, as I said, big, fast, clinch, punch. Very simple fighter is Daniel James. Very, a very, very simple fighter. Uh, I think it's a clash of styles in that, uh, in that way. Um, the one guy who is just trying to get inside and trying to make it a close dog fight inside where he is, you know, where he has the bigger bite, if you want to put it that way. And you have the other guy on the outside trying to be elusive, trying to move around, trying to be the faster, you know, um, as I'll use the word elusive again, the more elusive man. Um, and who's going to win that? Usually at heavyweight, it's the dog with the bite. <laughs> Wins it, if we're being honest, because all he has to do is catch you once, and that's that. Uh, but it's not always the case. Like, I think all around, I think Marcelo Golm is a better fighter than Daniel James. But we're heavy. We're talking about heavyweight MMA here now. And who am I picking to win? It's probably Daniel James. Because I think he will get that clinch. I think he will probably land that big uppercut. And he will hurt him at one stage. One thing I would do if I was going 100% is go for a takedown. As James's takedown defense is not great. He almost got choked out there in uh, in one of his recent fights as well. Um, Golm has a takedown in him. I watched, was it his last? I think it was his last fight. Was it the Tyrell Fortune fight? If I'm not mistaken, let me just look that up. He he got a big take down. Or sorry, uh, Davion Franklin fight it was. Uh, he got a big uh, he got a big takedown early in that fight. He ended up getting the rear naked choke actually uh, in the end. You know he has a few submissions uh, as well, and he's fighting over an American top team as well. So you know he's there's no mugs over there. So uh, that's definitely one thing you should throw in. You know I said he's very varied. If there's a bit of variation with a takedown in there as well, I think that could really really play for him. So. Um, uh, it's a, it's a good fight. I don't know who's going to win. To be honest, I, as I said, I'd probably go with, with James, but I wouldn't rule it out at all. If Gunn can get through those first two rounds, it's it's all for him. Uh, after that, we're in, interested to see how the, the five round pace as well suits both of them. So I suppose we'll uh, we'll see on that one. But yeah, I leave it there. You know what? Not a, not a bad card. Uh, interesting in terms of the heavyweight division. In term, interesting in terms of the women's featherweight division. 
possibly the middleweight division uh, as well. So we'll uh, we'll see how uh, see how it un- unfolds on, on Saturday night. All right, everyone. I will uh, I will leave it there. My name is uh, sorry. It's Friday night. It's Friday night. Friday night. Friday night. Uh, we leave it there. My name is Sean Sheen for Shardog.com and I'll see you all next time.